and welcome to episode 179 of the Great and Crowbar. How are you, Pip? <laughs> it's the 8th of March, isn't it? No, I don't know. It is. It totally is, at the time that we're recording this. It's probably a different time in the future. Anyway, it's, it's episode 179. My name's Chris Thurston, and here I am with Philippa War. Are you pleased with yourself? <laughs> we'll find out. And Alex oh. Wiltshire. Hello. Hello. Hello, Alex. Hello. Hello again. How are you? I'm all right. How are you, Pip? Thank you. I'm good. We're all uh, we're all extremely tired. This is a this will be a, a podcast powered by tea. Um, oh. I've run out already. Yeah, we're we're really getting getting into it. Um, <laughs> I have not thought this because I I'm I'm a little bit hungover for reasons. Um, Pip's jet lagged. <laughs> And reasons. Alex, I actually don't know if you're tired. I, I can never tell. I am tired. I feel okay. tired of life today. Mm. I'm one oh of those days. Oh I had a San Francisco cab driver once who told me that he was post-life. <laughs> and I was like, that's a very San Francisco thing. Did he mean tired? Well, this is yeah, the what thing. does that like, mean? Do you mean you're dead? Like, is that, are you a zombie driving a cab <laughs> for money? <laughs> In which case, but, <laughs> how good are your yeah, exactly. memories of how to drive? And things. But um, he was just like, yeah, I'm just really over it. And I was just like, oh, over, oh, fine. So I think it was just apathy. That's post-life. Mm. Sort of being tired of it all. So he doesn't exist on some sort of astral plane while driving. I think driving. he thought he might. I don't know. <laughs> it was all a very odd, odd situation. <laughs> What a bouncy, a bouncy start we're getting off to. Last time we spoke, Alex, um, it was because you very softly, gently s- smothered me in a game of Blood Bowl. Oh, yeah, that was a We've good game. We've been doing that. Good it was game. a good game for you. How's your league going? I'm, I'm terrible. I'm, I'm squarely last. There now. is a very specific reason why you're not, yes. your team isn't doing well. I bought a very expensive mine at all. He yeah. just, he just got excited by all that bully flesh. Indeed. Oof. <laughs> Bullish. Um, Thank goodness. At the expense of buying team rerolls, which are, I understand, extremely important yeah, if those you are have the things. my luck. But yeah, well, you just, you just have everyone's luck. Yeah. That's given the thing. how much whinging you've done about your terrible luck, why did you not buy Well, I don't really understand what I'm doing. This. He does now, though. No. I mean, I, you say whinging. I say interesting discussions about the improbable maths of things that are happening <laughs> to me all the time the thing is because you actually in the first half you were you were bonking, i was gonna win you were bonking my goats i was bonking your goats all day long my goats bonking your goats That's my how goats you get were goats. lying down <laughs> they were they were taking it yeah they were and um I don't how think... much of this is official terminology all of it we were actually talking about what chris and i got up to oh <laughs> While you were away, um, this was while you were away. It was one of the many. At least didn't make uses. a Dorito toasty again. Oh no, that that's not why. Ooh. If you put that on the internet, well, um, the um, I think it might have never already forget. Been the, indeed, um, I'll tell you what, we'll never forget that the toaster, um, <laughs> the uh, smell of spicy cheese. What is it? Hot cheese, cheese. tangy, oh, tangy, tangy, tangy cheese. cheese through the house oh. every time. Of, <laughs> two pieces of Warburton's whole meal. <laughs> It was the worst idea I've ever had. And as I had it, I knew it was the worst idea I've ever had. And that's why I did it. You're so pleased with yourself. <laughs> and that's, that's my super villain Orange. Pips here, not here to stop me and I'm yeah. going to have it. Well, the cats are away. The mice will forget how to be alive. <laughs> post-life. Post- Indeed. Yeah. A post-life. post <laughs> Yeah. Post-life. Post-life. <laughs> Uh, yes, indeed. Um, no, uh, and so I, I made one, um, cocky decision to, uh, to try and run somewhere in the last, what would have been the term where I scored. And I, I fell squarely on my fucking ass. And then your goat f- me, Alex. Yeah, it was wonderful. <laughs> I love Blood Bowl. I, I think, I don't know if I like it. it. It's a lovely way of spending a surprisingly long amount of time yeah, it's with like somebody. It's like two hours, yeah. two hour game. Two hours of sort of sat on discord just talking about nonsense. well the, the only thing is like what you it, it takes such concentration when because you have a time limit on your turn you often are unable to talk or like one is often unable yeah. to talk during your turn and the other player is sort of going 
so uh, did did you see anything on the TV last night? And they like, and you're aware that, that they can't really respond. Yeah, yeah, you can't maintain a conversation because you're constantly distracted by. And then you get like the, the socially awkward stuff where where when your player fell over, I felt bad, <laughs> but also felt really good. <laughs> and I struggled to know exactly the best response to make. <laughs> yeah, I think you just made a, a sort of, a kind of happy noise. Oh! Like a kind of, woo! woo! Yeah, um, it's a weird game. It's a very weird game. It's been a weird league, to be honest. I have lost all of my games and am now, yeah, dead last with basically no hope for, for redemption. Which is fine, because at least, at least that's a story. And that's what Bud Ball's all about. It's stories. not a very good story, though, Stories is where you There's lose. There's no arc. There's just, no. like, failure. There's an arc in the sense that it goes down. <laughs> That's not an arc. No, the, yeah, his arc, <laughs> his arc went from ignorance to slight knowledge to depression. Mm. Okay, he's looking for a Mighty duck style. I'm not getting it. No. It's mathematically impossible at this point. Cool run- not even a cool running. I can't even do a cool mm. running. Although I can't even do cool would... running. That's why he keeps falling over. His graph would look like what you could... You, yes. Luge off yes. Off. The the protagonist of Cool Runnings sure. could luge down my arc. <laughs> yep. That is that that is the only extent to which this is a sports Cinderella story. Yeah. In every other regard, it's a disaster. Hmm. And but who's anyway, winning? Uh, I think Matt Lees is winning. It is. Yeah. Yeah. That, I, I always I assumed it'd be him or Quinn's that would win. I just assume that they're, they're quite competitive. They're very competitive. Very competitive. Yeah. I thought I thought Kieran might might do well uh he, he is doing well oh he's doing he's, he's doing just I don't, fine I, I think he also doesn't want to be seen to try so there's a sort yeah. of that the natural third place kind of of the person who knows what they're doing but does he spend all of his time on. evangelizing about skaven yes. he is playing skaven, he is skaven obviously. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, um, obviously yes um yeah I, I got completely destroyed by kieran that was my first game then i got <laughs> completely destroyed by quinn's and then me and me and chris bratt drew in the slowest game of blood bowl two people have ever played is it because you were so busy being polite to each other? We were extremely, both extremely polite, both a little bit embarrassed about the punching. He's got dwarves, I've got chaos, no one, nothing can happen. <laughs> and I, no, he did win that one, I think. No, he won that one basically at the end of the final turn because one dwarf basically just sort of squeaked away. And then we both <laughs> lost a turn and then the game was over. <laughs> God. And then you and I, like I said, a very civil game. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, it was good. Actually, it was the best game I've played. It was fun, yeah. Best of a, uh, best of a, of a of a disappointing bunch. But it's yeah. a nice dynamic one actually. Yeah, they can often it was, end yeah. up being kind of bundle, like especially chaos versus chaos. Could have been a massive bundle in the middle, and no, no one would have gone anywhere. No, but we, we kept yeah. things moving around the back. We did, yeah. Goats were pounded on both sides, <laughs> <laughs> but ultimately you pounded your way to victory. Did and I just pounded my way off. <laughs> <laughs> Pip. Pips, Help. Pips, Pips faces a picture. No, you've dug yourself into this nonsense. You can jolly well get Again. yourself out. Um, more, any more of that? And I'll continue to be in the trouble I've already put myself in. So, uh, you've been to DDC. <laughs> I did. That was uh, good. Yes, indeed. That's why you're so tired. Yeah. Tell us about GDC. How, how are all the rendering pipelines? I saw two hummingbirds. Well, I know I saw a lot of hummingbirds, but I saw two of them really close. Is this in the... Where did you see I them? went to the botanical gardens. Oh, I did think it's kind <laughs> First of... First thing I did. <laughs> it's like, step aside, GDC. <laughs> There's nature to be seen. Um, but apart from that, I did, yeah. What did <laughs> I do? Like, there were rendering pipelines. I'm sure there were. I went to a talk about them, but I don't know what for. At this point, it's all gone a bit weird. Maybe Overwatch. <laughs> I think that might be a thing I did. <laughs> you saw Overwatch. Uh, <laughs> I've come for Overwatch, but not for the rendering pipelines. <laughs> I think I was there for the <laughs> rendering pipelines. I was like, I'm not interested in the rest of this nonsense. I went to, like, one of the Overwatch talks I went to was about how you animate first person. And so that was just interesting because it's about all the little tweaks and weird, like, broken fingers that you have to sort of put on things to make it look like it works from the first person perspective. Even though if you change the camera angle at all, it's like, what is wrong with that thing? 
<laughs> so that was kind of cool. Um, and I went to some maths talks, and I went to some audio talks, and more maths talks. <laughs> And I'm not cool, am I? <laughs> were you doing? Oh, well. Were you doing every day, all day, in the conference center, or were you kind of mixing kind it up a of. bit? Kind of. Last year, I did loads of like appointments and things, but that just essentially meant that I was stuck in South Hall the entire time, and not even in the actual expo bit. I was in the press room, just sort of not really seeing anything of anything or natural light, and so. You it's know. been a bit of a dead dungeon, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. And it's quite a big dungeon. Would, like, yeah, it's a cavernous, like, weird... Like, it's just a, a room that is far too tall. Like, <laughs> you could... you it, It's essentially a block of flats, but with none of the floors except the bottom one. And so, anyway. But I decided this year I wanted to see real people and hear about what they were doing. So I went to the conference talks and ah oh, the controllers and stuff from all control oh yeah was, that's always good yeah like that's always the best bit of the show floor stuff because often you just can't concentrate enough to actually play a game whereas the controller stuff is always just like look it's a spectacle enjoy the spectacle and so and it's varied enough and it feels uh sort of strange enough that you can really get something out of it that you can't from just taking a build home and stuff like that so this year like my favorite thing was a cardboard box that they'd done to look at um to look like a spaceship and it was on like um a series of i guess pressure pads and stuff and so you tilt it this way and that to like control the movement of a thing on the screen i mean i'm guessing you could probably get a similar effect from just putting a cardboard box on a dance mat you know mm. and like you know just making sure that you applied the pressure the right way and then like on the front was kind of a flattened jam tart tin thing that was the button that you press to fire your lasers <laughs> into the asteroid field and stuff and that was just really lovely and you had like a colander on your head as your space helmet and it had earphones inside that was sort of making um pew pew human noises you know like <laughs> and it was just so cute so i had the best time and i didn't want to get out um and then there was just like a bunch of other things like you had um oh one of the games was you had a journal with a bunch of like uh it, it had an index that had like the answers to something that you would see on screen so you'd be in a room on the screen and the screen would have like i don't know a mirror or something and then in the index you'd find the clue that corresponded to the mirror idea and then it would take you to another page that would have a riddle the riddle would lead you to a book and the book would be on the bookcase in front of you and you'd tilt it back like you were activating a secret passageway oh, cool. in you know an old-fashioned like spy novel or something and then in doing so that was the trigger for the game to move on to the next room and stuff so you were essentially just moving down a passageway by like picking the right books and stuff so that was awesome um and there was another thing which was like a printer motor that was attached to a um a piece of string but the motor was in a box and it was like telling you that it was a little puppy that you were having a little tug of war with and so you'd just sort of be pulling on this string and the box would be pulling back and it was just really cute Aww. so yeah there were loads of things like that and it was really good i had a really good time oh and there was um a laser liar which was like um just this so you know like a a, a liar like in greek mythology you know the stringed instrument um it was that but where the strings were actually just sort of green like lights laser lights and by interrupting them with your fingers you'd play different notes according to like this um uh guitar hero type setup on the screen like it was actually really difficult because there was no haptic feedback yeah and so, i did always wondered that yeah yeah and so i ended up playing it where um because where the lights were being emitted from that stuck up ever so slightly from the bottom of the of the lyre frame and so i was sort of using them almost as like how you have the holes on a recorder so you position your fingers in the right way mm. so i was kind of like tapping on those rather than plucking at the like these light strings and stuff so 
And there was one more that I really loved that I should probably mention, which was the emotional fugitive detector. And that was this thing <laughs> where one of you was in a box <laughs> looking at a screen. You know, you, it was kind of like a booth and you're looking at a screen and the computer is like scanning your face, which is obviously positioned right so that you can look at the screen and it's detecting emotions like particular sort of facial movements that signify anger or sadness or happiness and all of that kind of stuff um and so what you are doing is you're trying to communicate an emotion to the person on the other side of the grill that looks into this box but without the machine catching you doing it because you're in a sort of like a police state <laughs> that doesn't believe in humans having emotions and stuff. And so, yeah, like it will say anger and you have to sort of like work out how to convey that with your face so that the other person gets it right on their options, but that you don't get caught. So you can't say anything. No, it's all in your facial expressions. And so... Huh. I could do surprise. It didn't seem very good at picking that up or I was better at not getting caught. And I think sadness, but anger, it's really good at recognizing. And I'm assuming it's just because you kind of move your forehead by default in a very particular way. And maybe that's just more universal across face shapes or something. And happiness, which it failed me on when my face was neutral. Because like I hadn't even made the face and it was like, you're too happy. And I was like, You just oh, like being in this box, don't you? That's nice. <laughs> but yeah, and apparently it was quite rare for it. It, it. it did sort of read a lot of people's neutral faces as happy, which was quite sweet. And I thought it probably said good things about the the alt control section. <laughs> But, like, very occasionally you'd have someone who it read as sad, and I was like, oh, no, they must be really sad. <laughs> that's well, maybe it's, maybe the opposite is true, and what it's when it's registering it, it's because, like, that's basically as good as it gets. This is your happy face right now. <laughs> and so it's actually much better for it to think that your resting face is sad because, you know, you can only get up from there. Oh. Sorry, I, I made that, I've made that oh. sad. Well, I had a nice time. <laughs> <laughs> of the two games about being in a box, which was your favourite? I like being in the cardboard box. That was good. <laughs> no, that that, the shoot, that the, wasn't the, the question. The space, the space shooty yeah. cardboard box. The other one was a metal box. I oh, didn't okay. mention that, but it was different for me. <laughs> it wasn't. It, yes, it wasn't a similar box experience. There's loads of them, though. I wrote about. I, I wrote a, an article for RPS that has like a whole bunch of them mm. detailed out, so hopefully... That would be more useful. Sorry, I just went off on one. No, it's good. What, what has everyone else been doing? <laughs> well, we we talked for quite a long time about our goat action. Oh, that's true. Indeed, yeah. Yeah, that was most of the week you were away, Pip, not going to yeah. lie. Well, um, it kind of bled into everything, really. Yeah, I yeah. played Tacoma. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> How's Tacoma? Tacoma. <laughs> I hardly knew her. <laughs> Maybe. Does that work? It does, yes. Oh, good. Tacoma. Yeah. No, I think everywhere you can go with that is bad. Um, no, it was, I really, really loved it because it has the object wiggling and picking up and examining of Gone Home, but it combines it with this, um, it's almost like a, a tiny scale version of a punch drunk theatre thing mm. where it plays you a bit of like recording from just before whatever the big major malfunction on the space station was and so you sort of see these holograms of the crew you know wandering around having chats you know doing things and if you're in different bits of the room or different sort of uh, you're following different people around, then you hear different things and you see different things happening, which was, you know, kind of cool. And you get to, um, you can control the timeline as well. So you can scrub back and forwards to follow different people or to see different things or even to solve little puzzles and things. So I thought that was actually really well integrated. Like I, I'd sort of been not looking at the game deliberately because I wanted to have a nice sort of I really don't like seeing games like that when they're halfway done because it's almost like you've seen it in its pants and you can't forget that you know it's yeah. like I just 
I want to see the nice finish. Yeah, when thing. you hear that equivalent of that dialogue in the final game, it all you'll be reminded of is yeah, yeah, of like the thing where it wasn't quite working, or the thing where it glitched out, or you know, all of that stuff. So, but that was really nice, and I played it twice. Once at the mix event on the Monday, and the other time was just um, it was on the day of the devs stand um in the north hall and so both experiences were different and that was really encouraging because it was only a small slice of the game but i sort of found a bunch of different things and played it for me meaningfully differently both times so yeah that was really encouraging Mm. really excited about that awesome glad to hear it's coming along well Mm. anything else before we wrap up on duty seeds anything else leap out at you from your time there um, on the VR front, I really, really loved that I went to a an appointment. I didn't really do any VR apart from this, but it was billed as a VR picture book. Um, and so I was like, okay, I'll check that out. And that particular game was called Delilah's Gift. But the uh, the developer, Isaac Cohen, has a bunch of other games that I hadn't seen that are already out in VR and like other projects that are online that I wasn't familiar with. And he just does some really, really interesting things in terms of how you use the space and what you encourage people to do and how you encourage people to sort of, you nudge them into these like gentle, playful mindsets and interactions and stuff so there was one where um i think it's called it's either loon or l-u-n-e because there are lots of spaces and there's capital letters and it's okay fine um and that one you sort of you start playing with the connections between things that are above you in the space and they sort of they end up being like beams that you can you know put together in different ways and connect and move around and I'd started moving them down sort of towards me and then I realized that actually there was a sort of a layer of digital fabric for want of a better word like draped over them and so what I was doing was I was actually bringing them down towards me but it was creating like more and more of like a blanket fort effect and it was like you'd start to sort of experiment with like the shape around you and sort of feeling kind of cozy and you know all of that kind of stuff and that was really interesting Mm. um and there was another thing that was um a project for uh, SF MoMA, which is the modern art uh, thing over the road uh, from the conference centre. And they had a, I think it was like a mixed reality event um, they were billing it as. And he had something there and it was this little play space in virtual reality where you'd have like a like a golden tunnel thing that sort of pulsated and there were these green uh shoots that had like trumpet kind of bells on the end and were sort of making sound and pulsing and there were like pink grass that you could sort of run your hand through using the controller and it would like swish and it was really cool and then you'd start playing with like these nodes that you could pick up and reconnect and then you realized that some of the like when you reconnected it a certain way it shrank everything down so you end up in this like massive like giant scale kind of situation and then if you did it a different way then you'd end up with like everything being supersized and you'd be tiny and it was just this really cool exercise in in manipulating scale and just being fun and bright and vibrant and mm. it was so cool mm. are any of these going to be available outside of those contexts or is it so um i'm not sure about the uh sf moma thing um because i haven't seen that on the website he's got like a hub site thing um but the there are three or f- there's four games on uh on steam at the moment i think one of them's free and is kind of like a almost like a desktop toy that you can kind of play with and then the other three that are on there um there's loon which i think is like you know one pound fifty kind of thing 
and there's two others which are like two quid and they're more kind of um mini game type things so you've got like a ball that you bounce and you, it's kind of like you play keepy uppy but every time you bounce it through a hoop and keep it going it collects another ball that is attached to that one and if it if those balls hit your paddle that you're waggling around to hit the original one then you lose so it's about sort of like this building sense of chaos i guess and and it's actually really effective and really cool mm. um but yeah the the two that are kind of like that a uh, couple of quid and i'm not sure about delilah's gift because i haven't had a chance to fully play that yet so i wanted to wait until i have done to give a verdict fair enough mm. have to get the the vibe set up again indeed that'll be good speaking of setting up Valve things, segue time. N- n- never going to do a better segue than last week, so I'm not even going to fucking try. <laughs> um, Alex, you've been linking Steam. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. I got uh, th- they had the Steam link in the sale last week, mm. this weekend. And I thought, heck, I've sold, <laughs> I've sold Easy, some of those bad on. things. <laughs> I've got some money in my account. <laughs> I'm going to buy one of those Steam links, um, and it came very quickly. So my review of the delivery uh, was very good. Mm. Comes in nice box as well. I hadn't really realised that. Have you have you played? Have you no. Used the Steam Link. I uh, use my to prop up my monitor. <laughs> <laughs> I, yes, <laughs> which seems really privileged, but I just I don't. I'm not very good with new technology. I do not adapt well to change. So I was close to doing that. So I've got a bit of a, I've, we're I've in an old house, an old bath house, and um, a bath it's house. Elect- yeah, I- <laughs> an old bath house where you have made your lair, <laughs> <laughs> steaming all year long. Oh, God, um, uh, mildewy. It, our electricity system is really quite ropey, and um, I don't know, probably made over a series of different years with different bits kind of added to it um and so so whenever i've tried doing sort of um uh, sort of steam over the network through a laptop attached to our tv it's just been pretty terrible but that's been over a while that's not going to thing i wonder whether a dedicated bit of hardware like the steam link would do a better job and so i uh, plugged it in and it did the same job as my oh, as my um my um laptop and i knew that that our network is definitely to to blame, mm. and I thought, ah, fine. I knew that would be the case. It comes with a really nice network cable. Oh. It's um because we had this horrible yellow one before, and this one is like, oh, it's flat and it's black, and oh, it's really nice. Mm. And it comes with an HDMI cable as well, and uh, we were low on them, so that's good. <laughs> so so all I thought I was up. <laughs> a good value yeah. pair of cables. <laughs> nice. And a little monitor stand. But then, yeah, exactly. Wait, I was no, getting all I've realized, getting ready. I've realised that I mistook the Steam Link for the Steam Controller. That's what was propping up my monitor. How? But it's all lumpy and it bumpy. It was in a box. Oh, the box. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of things I didn't I didn't know we owned until I discovered that they were propping something Probably up. Probably just all under well, its I mean, monitor. But to be fair, there's a lot of things that I discover that we don't own because, you know, you're prone to putting empty boxes back in things. So on the whole, I would say that we're net neutral. It's good to have the grudge thrown return from its <laughs> good. world tour. Book of grudges. Airing those grievances. <laughs> Um, yeah. hmm. but we, um, we had a, we, we, we got some electricians in, uh, on Friday. Magicians? Electricians. Oh, uh, yeah. They <laughs> that was the really most awake I've seen you all day. <laughs> Magicians, you say? <laughs> now I'm interested. <laughs> Colour me interested. <laughs> Maybe it would be like, good. I would like to have some magicians visit the house, but they're, but they're to sort out your <laughs> <to> living, in, <laughs> living in Bath, you probably do get like the electricity wizard. He did have shall a little goatee. Summon... One of the electricians had a little goatee, so it was quite <laughs> quite oh. magiciany. Problem you've got here. It's, it's, it's with your sprites. Do you not see? They're all tired. Buy... <laughs> do you not have to buy internet by the pound out here? <laughs> Indeed, Maybe yeah. that's why your yours is on the fritz. Yeah. because you know you just you've run low. You've run low. <laughs> Scraping the box. <laughs> yeah. Um. They discovered that in time, in, in memorial times gone past, uh, someone drove a wire through one of the 
mains things, electrical magic things. Is that not dangerous? Probably. We probably <laughs> every day, whenever, since whenever this has happened, uh, we've probably been running the risk of our whole house being set on fire. It's probably fine now, though. He's fine. He's fixed. Probably it's all fine. fine. <laughs> it's all good. Best of all, the Steam Link's fixed. It's what? so good now. It runs totally smoothly. But is the Steam Link fixed or was it the same thing that has been fixed and you just have a Steam Link now? We, um, uh, <laughs> <laughs> probably. It probably would have run perfectly fine through. But at least it's under the telly and I've got some nice cables. But, um, before it would like, it would be fine. It'd be running, you know, for, you know, 60 frames a second and whatever. Uh, you know and what? then it would hitch and oh. like the, 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 the image would just freeze on the screen before it kind of recovered itself. And now it's just totally smooth. And now we can play downstairs. Picking up from a conversation we had uh, last time I was here, mm. uh, I can I haven't managed to find the time yet, but I can play Resident Evil 7 with my wife. Seven? Six? Seven. 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 With my <laughs> wife, and she can try to get me through all the scary bits. Huh. So, I, and because you won't go up, upstairs to where the pc is i don't like that room she says don't make me go in there <laughs> in the but resident evil <laughs> is fine yeah <laughs> exactly the pc that's the problem. She, so so my wife um runs a cake business she makes cakes wedding cakes and things and uh she 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 likes to watch horror films <laughs> While she's making cakes. So she'd be making beautiful flowery, sugar paste flowers and, and kind of beautiful pinks and blues and wonderful greens and kind of flower like, uh, and she's watching horror films all the way through. <laughs> all I can hear coming from, from downstairs, uh, is it kind of screams and <laughs> chainsaws and it's amazing yeah. that's awesome she should do it so that the next one she does like you cut it open and blood kind of, like, <laughs> yeah. trickles out of the side there should good. be a market for it yeah well i thought your um your electricity story was going to have a horror ending i thought you were it might say, well still do like, might do well i thought you were going to say and then they investigated and we'd never been connected <laughs> <laughs> we were running on magic and they were yeah, magicians. Like the were electricity haunted. was coming from inside the house. <gasps> <laughs> inside the bathhouse. Mm. <laughs> Don't want electricity in a bathhouse. That's going to be dangerous. Yeah. But I was, I'm, I'm impressed. I kind of, I'd kind of written off the whole streaming paradigm a little bit because, you know, partly because everybody's, you know, there must be not that many households that can like, you know, technically, give a good experience you know mm. um there are lots of terrible wiring systems and i read lots of things online about how modern houses are, have aluminium wires or something which i didn't think that aluminium could carry electricity but i don't know uh that apparently is means that you can't run home plugs through it so easily oh, i right. should i should explain our network is through home plugs. yeah i assumed yeah, that but, yeah, but um, i just realized that not everyone would have assumed that mm. Uh, Hence the electricity. Yeah, we don't have a cat, whatever system running through our walls. <laughs> no, you don't have a cat. Cats, or yeah, hmm. yeah. I'm allergic <laughs> to cats, actually. So yeah. am I. Yeah, no way. Yeah, oh, for God's sake. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Last you, week was so good, wasn't it? I'm not allergic <laughs> to cat five cables, but I. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, um, but I found it really responsive, like in a way that I was surprised by, because I've done a bit of streaming, like on the play ps4 and through mm. remote play on that and that was always yeah, played like in my uh destiny uh obsession that was sort of when somebody's hogging the tv that was fairly unpleasant but kind of a sort of dealt yeah. with the obsession a little bit mm. but um yeah like i, I found it Lovely. I mean, it's sort of it's the the lag and things have been surprisingly dealable with. Hmm. Noticeable to start with, but then dealable with, I thought. Cool. Do you think you will continue to get use out of it? Yeah, I think I will. Um, it's the thing that I can do downstairs rather than stay upstairs. Um, it's the, it's, I think certain types of games are really good for it. Hmm. So I tried out, um, a new game, Loot Bandits, yes, last night. Oh, yeah. Which is really nice, cute, kind of, funny um roguelike uh which i can't really give an opinion on yet because partly because the i 
developers of friends but partly also because i didn't play enough but it's the kind of game that you can do on that because it's semi-term well it is turn-based yeah. with a kind of direct control element to it but you know it doesn't require kind of that immediate thing mm. i um, own that and i had forgotten well i hadn't forgotten <laughs> it was it's propping up a monitor that, <laughs> yes yes because <laughs> they did a thing a little while ago where you could buy into early access but they called oh, yes. it something else and i can't remember what it was yes it was Prospective some, edition or something it was something like that. like that wasn't it and then so i picked up a copy because i was like look i'm gonna get it anyway and i you know it looked really promising and then I think just the entirety of that week's other releases and other projects and whatever else it was that I was working on just hit me and and it's really nice to have the reminder because it's like oh yeah because it seemed really kind of like spirited like had a really yeah. good like nature to it yeah now the, the introductory movie to it is just so funny like, yeah the animation and the voice the yes uh, Davey somebody he's a animator it's just nat one of those just naturally funny people i don't know whether it would translate to an american audience or anyone outside of the uk <laughs> but like to me to us it's so good so funny mm. cool is that and that's out now right yeah came out yesterday, out yesterday. Mm. Mm. that might be one for a future pod in more depth depth then depth depth tail yeah mm. yeah but yes, I, I was I, I'm I'm pleased with my punt. A good punt. A good punt. <laughs> and not just a monitor prop or a box with some cables in it. There's always time for that. No, indeed. I think I I don't know where it is now. It'll be somewhere. <laughs> I'm using push, uh, back issues of PC Gamer to prop my monitor up. Now. Look. Print's got to get by how it's going to get by. <laughs> I think that it's like I could only use the ones that had my byline in them. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> so, like, I can't really adjust the height of my desk too much. <laughs> Otherwise, I'm screwed. i got to write more issues. No. <laughs> oh. Need it higher. <laughs> <laughs> Sam, could you just put my name in a few of them for no good reason? <laughs> It'll be fine. <laughs> That's a weird thing about leaving the the magazine that you worked on for five and a half years. It's picking which issues you take with you. Um, well, did you not have copies of everything? Well, we had copies of. Everything. I can't take copies of everything. Like, I can't. I can't take every. Copy no, but of you piece. personally didn't bring copies home. I think is what he was asking. No, I brought a whole load of copies home, but I had still had to pick. On which... a month by month basis, you could have brought them home. Oh no, and I didn't. That's true. Um, so yes, <laughs> I get you now. But uh, yes, yeah, so I had to. <laughs> Because I kept them in the office, right? Like I had my little. I row had, of them. when I worked on a magazine, I had a home set and a desk set. Oh, yeah. I, I found um, that space is <laughs> finite, and uh, yeah, so that didn't happen. But no, it's still still real strange trying to prune it down to the just special the ones, a dozen or so that yeah, that you would want to remember mm. or even do remember. Which was was there an easy one? Was, was the, there an easy the, favorite? Well, the three that I edited because I was acting at yeah, the game for three yeah. months, so that was obvious. Um, my the first Dota one, maybe. Yeah, my, actually, I didn't. I think I've got the Dota one somewhere. My first one and my last one. Oh, my last one in house. Um, so the most recent one and and issue two, three, four. I did seventy issues of PC game, which is kind of nuts. It's uh, terrifying, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. Um, I'll try not to spill anything on them. I've, I've I've put them somewhere where you would be unlikely to spill anything. Interesting. <laughs> <laughs> High up, then. <laughs> no, no, very low down. That's where I spill things. <laughs> <laughs> well, they're on that bottom shelf. I can there. see them. <laughs> <laughs> well, fine. <laughs> You'd have to go into the corner of the room and manage to spill something onto the bottom shelf of a bookcase. Yeah, but I mean, I'm over there messing with your Star Wars dolls, mostly, aren't I? <laughs> they're not dolls, Pip. <laughs> they're detailed game pieces. <laughs> <laughs> like what an adult might own. <laughs> okay. <sighs> <sighs> Only my own grudge thrown. <laughs> what have you been up to, Christopher? I've been playing Ghost Recon Wild... Lads, well, the Wild Lads on tour, <laughs> yeah. on the, yeah. the Recon Wild tour. Lands, Tom Clancy's, Tom Clancy's Lads, 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 yeah. Tom Clancy's <laughs> Ghost lads Recon, Lads on tour. 
World at War. <laughs> Bant's oh, Recon. Bant's Recon. Do you know what, though? Since Tom Clancy died, that kind of implies, you know, Tom Clancy's Ghost Recon. Yeah, like, exactly. He's, he's out there. He's it's doing It's an episode of thing. Ghost Hunters where you go looking yeah. for Tom Clancy's ghost. <laughs> Yvette Fielding's in the corner, like, yeah. shrieking her head off. Derek Acora's, like, having a chat with someone in the corner. Be great. Why didn't I write this game? <laughs> if you can hear us, Tom, move the at hollow site on this <laughs> yeah, well, custom M16. The socio-political situation <laughs> in Central America has changed. The, the Ouija down. board goes mental. <laughs> <laughs> the new hotspots are New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> you have the Ouija board in front of you and like the, the little lens <laughs> thing goes to E and then M and then P <laughs> and then just keeps going to EMP over and over again until the Cold War ends. <laughs> Um. Uh, so yes, I've been playing Ghost Recon Wildlands, which came out this week. It is Ubisoft's most recent Ubi game. Um, Uber game. Ubi game. Um, and so far, I really don't like it at all. Oh. I would say that it is a bad computer game. Um, and I will presently explain <laughs> <laughs> why I think that. <laughs> so. I- <laughs> So there's, there's several angles to this, and I, I would. I, this is based on six hours or so, um, and also with the major caveat that what I haven't done yet is play it in proper co-op with a friend. I have done its public matchmaking thing, and that wasn't great. And I've played it mostly solo, um, and I sort of planned it that way. I thought, like you know. It advertises a co-op game. It is supposed to be you and up to three other people going on these sort of ghostly reconnaissance um, adventures in in Bolivia. Um, but um, even so, uh, with the understanding that it's a you know a full priced open world game and that um, you know everything is better in in co-op. I, I wanted to at least see what the single player experience was like. Yeah. Um, like do the first. So the way it is structured is it's, it's structured quite a lot like Crackdown. If you remember Crackdown, um, in that you have a huge open world and a, a cartel to take down. And that cartel is an, a web of, you know, lieutenants and sub lieutenants and so on. And each zone has key characters in it. And you go and find intel from bases or reveal the locations of missions which you can go and do and then you can do those missions to unlock encounters with these key characters who you can then kill and in doing so you you know that's how you progress through the game so you're after this sort of initial starter area kind of thing you are free to go in any direction and kind of start tugging at those strings in any order that you want uh which is a fine structure for a game um it's obviously it's 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 had its critical path stripped down a lot to make it very co-op friendly. You can just all load up into the same world and run off in different directions and do different things if you want. Um, where it, um, but there's a, uh, and it's obviously intended that you will do this with friends. Um, however, I'm a bit wary of of that being the sort of the the cop out or the co-op out. If you will, um, oh, because, <laughs> um, will because like I say, every game is better in that way most of the time, right? Like you can make doing anything better by making it a fun thing that people can do together with all the slapstick yeah. kind of nuts, you know, fun that comes with playing a game with another group of people. Um, it, you know, that can make a mediocre game fun and worthwhile. But it doesn't stop it being a mediocre game. And there's nothing stopping a very good game from then being even better in co-op. Yes. And so I think, I think Ghost Recon will find people, like it will, it will probably, and I'll get into its flaws, but I think it will have better, you know, it will have value to people who are in the perfect position to play it at its best, which I, I, I think is you and a few friends haven't played it and you're all willing to put in the time and only, and play with each other and regularly dip in. Um, in every other context, including playing it by yourself and um, being reliant on its sort of matchmaking to find co-op strangers, um, it's pretty poor. And so uh, part of that is, I think, because of that structure where it's it's had all of its kind of what what might be kind of any kind of structured moment or scripted moment has been stripped back and to make it just a, a big f- fucking box of UB content. 
you know the first thing it teaches you to do in the game is um you know infiltrate an outpost shoot some people with with your silence weapons find a uh an officer and interrogate him for intel and it is showing you this because this is one of its versions of climb the tower and synchronize this is one map activity that you can expect to do uh, a bajillion times mm-hmm. the next mission you do or like leads up to the next mission you do is go to a place and rescue a prisoner who gives you a piece of intel and that is another one of its little verbs you know um, you might go to a place and photograph a map on a wall, and that's another one of its things. You might go to a place and steal a key vehicle and deliver it somewhere. That's another one of its things. And, and you know, it very quickly teaches you all of the different things there are to do in the game at a basic level. And in my experience so far, it hasn't really mixed that up at all. And that's boring. Do they all have different... Do they have, like, similar icons, like the... The car they're not one, really... are they all like wheels on the map? Yeah, it's, it's, it is a map full of things. Yeah. Um, it's a, it's a huge laundry list of, of collectibles and objectives to hoover up. Um, in terms of your interaction with, so in, in that sense, um, the other game that's a lot like is Just Cause to some degree in, in the sort of the, the military kind of destabilize a country kind of sense. Um, what it doesn't have is any of Just Cause's exuberance, really. Yeah. So because it's a Ghost Recon game, uh, it's quite... So I'll get into its tone in a minute. But, you know, from a from a, from a a design point of view, it's quite a serious tactical shooter-ish. I mean, it's been... Uh, so you can, you know, ramp the difficulty up to a billion and switch all the UI off and play it in, like, Ghost Recon mode if you want. By default, it's a pretty competent third-person shooter. It's not dazzling. It's not bad at being a third-person shooter um, uh, with vehicles and stuff that you can drive around. Um, it has one kind of cool feature, uh, which is this thing called... Uh, well, you, like, you've got gadgets, like a little drone. You can fly around to tag enemies and things like that. But you've you've tagged enemies with drones and binoculars in i've tagged you, enemies with an owl and yeah. i can't go back you have from done that. The, you have done this in watchdogs far cry etc etc right lots of the ubisoft games have this mechanic in, in one way or another its thing is called sync shot as in synchronized which is when you tag people you can then you can set you know a scaling number as you level up using upgrade points and skills and resources found around the map uh you can increase the number of people you can tag and then um and then well sort of mark for death and then your ai squad mates standing in for co-op buddies will run off and find and line up shots on those on those enemies and then the next time you either you can either activate it manually or the next time you fire they will fire and take out those people and they're they're pretty good at it and so it creates some sort of kind of it's not mind-blowing at all um but it creates some nice sort of stealth moments where you you know you pick two guards maybe either side of a base and then you assassinate the officer in the middle so when the fight breaks out there's sort of a nice sense of chaos as you know crucial targets that might otherwise cause problems for you all drop at the same time um however and that's an idea in co-op i think it translates to your ability to mark opponents for your human allies to, to take out um like however the ai isn't really advanced enough um to furnish a meaningful challenge for a stealth game it does have gta or just cause style ai when you've when you're in the kind of spotted state and they're kind of after you they'll just sort of run at you or you know run around and there's not there's no sort of real intelligent um distribution of information or anything you're either you're in a you're in a gta style alert state or you're not they will go and look at your last known location yeah on, on in in huge numbers but that's kind of it and the alert stage stops and then they kind of return to the Yeah, they go away again. again. It, 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 I think it masks its fundamental lack of finesse uh, with a lot of, um, a lot of reactive voice acting, both for your companions and for the AI. So the AI will say like, you know, we've, we're, we're, we're at their last known location and we haven't seen anything. And you think that means that they're really looking, but it really just means they've run to waypoint A and done bark three. Um, your teammates will spot for you if, if, if they see things and they will, and it's quite, that's quite impressive is, is it has, they've obviously recorded a shitload of voice work for things like churches and barns. And I mean, it's, it's a lot of churches and barns and houses and things and sniper nests and things, but it'll, and then it'll turn that into a little conversation where a character will say, I've just spotted somebody. And then someone will say, where? And they say, top of the barn. And then it'll do that dynamically. 
and it, that sounds kind of it, it you know mm. the most of you know that that's quite successful but again um it's a it's it is a quite a sort of smoke and mirrorsy presentation thing standing in for fundamental lack of depth yeah, i would say yeah because it's a, a co-op uh ai spotting an enemy for you is a fairly familiar kind of concept in yeah and also that ai your co-op you know your squad um where you can give them orders and things the game cheats enormously in order to make sure they're never in position. So, you know, if you like squad combat, you know, squad tactics games like, you know, Armor or the Ghost Recon of old or anything like that, this abstracts what it means to have three other people in your squad to such an extent that you might as well be one person with magic powers. Um, like, so if you get on a motocross bike with like a one person bike and fuck off, when you get off it, they will sort of spring out around you if you get into a if you get into a helicopter and fly away they'll just be in it in a couple of seconds they just teleport in you know when you start playing you like you, you do the sort of thing about trying to dramatically extract your squad only to realize you don't have to and also to only to realize that the ai can't really handle that like it can't successfully get in a, a helicopter under duress because it fights its own kind of programming whether it fights or not um they can't be spotted by enemies uh, they're invisible to enemies um, because I think to have them be visible to enemies would risk the your your own squad mates screwing up your stealth sometimes. I can imagine them, yeah, kind of sort of flitting about from cover to cover as yeah, the game yeah. tries to work out. So, um, and if you look at the minimap, pay any attention to the minimap, they do appear to teleport quite a lot. Like, into, if you give them what is like two quite difficult sync targets, sometimes they'll struggle to find, like, you know, to get an angle on the other target you want. But when you say, like, you know, get a bead on that guy on the other side of the base for me, you wait a couple of seconds and it happens. And if you watch the actual guy, it'll be like, and he's on that hill now. And he's getting there at shot ready. So there's no sort of real sense of attachment to them as part of the world, really. They're like... It and feels what, like they're full of concessions to make sure you don't get frustrated as yeah. a player. And, that's, and that then makes the sync shot thing, which is its thing, right? It doesn't have just causes grapple. It doesn't have just causes kind of mad acrobatics. It doesn't have um you know rainbow six's fidelity or anything like that what it has is this synchronized shooting mechanic but it really just feels like a smart bomb you know what i mean like it's just it is just pick enemies that you want to die wait until the light goes green press button um without any real sense of attachment to the world like one of the funniest things i've seen uh, it's it's buggy as well and one of the things that funniest things i've seen so far um was i i was I got into like the highest alert state in the middle of a very wide open freeway and I ran away, ran, 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 ran in the opposite direction. Um, and the, the baddies came along and they all piled out of their cars and did the kind of like, we're checking the last known location thing. And, um, and I turned around to look only to realize that the other ghosts, um, had stayed. They hadn't run back to catch up with me yet. But the AI was obviously trying to, but because they were in stealth mode, they were all crouched in the middle of the road, squatting, in, like feet from the enemies, <laughs> very, very slowly squatting and walking backwards. <laughs> and so you have these sort of muscle bound, you know, drug cartel men shouting about like, we've lost them again, while dudes in like very conspicuous ghillie suits just walk backwards right in front of them extremely slowly he's getting total unintentional slapstick <laughs> i've been lethally ran over by a man i rescued um after he teleported into the driver's seat of the car i wanted to take and immediately drove off at full speed and killed me um the very first time i got into like one of the like kill a boss you know kill one of the the, the boss men um, moments which it, it gates in ways to prevent you from a to prevent you from just encountering it in the open world and solving it without doing the prerequisites which is lame if you're going to have this big open world let me skip to the end if i happen to find the place i'm looking for but also it, it uses you know doors and sort of inaccessible areas to kind of give you a little cinematic presentation of these people before you shoot them um i got shot to bits right at the beginning and when you in single player when you get shot a bit like a multiplayer your ai buddies will come over and revive you but what happened was they came over killed everybody in the room including all the targets and then revived me so um my character was kind of 
stuck in while dead or like dying kind of half in the conversation with your handler about that target's down and it was trying to advance the plot for the next bit but i couldn't really hear or see a fucking thing because i I died (laughs) and so this is this was like the first of the games you know you know this was the culmination of a bunch of open world work and i didn't get to do it because the ai just did it for me um so that all that stuff has been just extremely unimpressive basically (laughs) for the amount of um for the amount of investment that's clearly gone into what is a huge game like it's it's a, it's a massive bag of stuff world yeah and there there are things that i just don't think are forgivable being this wonky like the shooting is fine but it's not amazing right like it's not there are far better shooters that you could be playing right now uh the driving cars and things is okay but it's you've done this you've driven a car in an open world game it's like that um the flying is awful and given that helicopters and planes are a part of it, you'd think they would get that right. Like most of the games get this right. It, it's weird. It feels like it feels like there's a huge dead zone on lots of the controls. Um, so it's very kind of like finickety. Um, the, the, the helicopter control scheme can't really seem to decide if helicopters are planes or helicopters in terms of like what pulling the stick in different directions does. Like you can, in, if you used to a helicopter in GTA or Battlefield or something, you get a sense of how it can work with the control pad. Yeah. And it, it doesn't feel great at all. Like the helicopters you find early on have like forward firing Gatling guns that are impossible to aim. Impossible. Like you can't like, cause they fire directly forward, not towards where the center of the screen is. So you, and the helicopters swing around a lot as you rotate them into the next position. So if you want to strafe, you have to kind of catch it at the point in the animation where it happens to be sort of swinging downwards. Uh, it's pointless. Like, yeah, I don't like, I'm surprised that it's getting some kind of warm reception because I genuinely think it's a pretty bad game that I'm looking forward to playing with friends because I think that will redeem it. But I don't know if you can ever it'll be, it'll, it'll redeem it probably despite itself because it'd be fun to experience yeah. all the j- jankiness together. But you know, I think, I'd far rather be playing a GTA heist, I think. Just, I mean, simply by virtue of the fact that all of those systems have, every, every system I've interacted with so far has either been mediocre or poor. And that's not good enough, really. Like, you know, it needs to do one thing amazingly well, whether that's tethering cars together so you can blow them up. I appreciate that's not appropriate for a Tom Clancy game, but maybe therefore this isn't a good fit for a Tom Clancy. Yeah, you, because, for a Tom Clancy, you need it's about precision and and yeah. careful, controlled situations, and you know, dealing with disaster or managing it beforehand. Yeah, and this feels like it devolves into chaos a lot yeah. because that is the nature of open world games, and because that is the nature of co-op games, really. Mm. But like, surely the I, I don't know, like listening, it just feels a bit like. I wouldn't necessarily, like, playing with friends will elevate a lot of things, you know, even if they're not much fun, you know, if you've got the right group of people. But I do feel a little bit like if if it's a game that has been designed specifically for co-op, I'm not sure of the merits of focusing too heavily on the single player. I mean, like sure to get a feel for like weapon systems or driving or whatever else because that won't change but in terms of like you know whether you can sync up what you're doing or in terms of you know whether you get caught by something it sounds like um the systems that they've put to sort of fudge it for if you don't have those friends around like just wouldn't be able to compare to real people particularly not real people who might actually get good at the systems Mm. so you know it might just be that if you had four people who were determined to to sort of put in a bunch of time or that that happened to be their default way of like hanging out of an evening for a significant chunk of time it might be that the precision like you'd tend to chaos in the beginning but then the reward would be maybe that you could execute on things like really tightly later on and it's you know it's entirely possible that the game won't do that and that it'll still be like baggy and messy and not particularly anything to write home about once you get into the multiplayer stuff as well but 
I don't know, to me it feels a bit like if something is definitely billing itself as a co-op experience, it I don't think it's necessarily just that having friends around elevates a poor game. I mean, maybe. So I have, I like, I, can't, I see what you're saying, and this is partly one of the reasons I said that I think for the right people in the right circumstance, sure. Um, but I think that necessarily makes it a more niche proposition that it's being marketed as because this is their you know 50 pound triple a does everything mega game of mm. the moment and um and you know it, it while i think it does advertise as a co-op game and it's desperate for you to play it in co-op it's constantly doing a pop-up to tell you why not connect why not connect to public matchmaking why not connect to public matchmaking so clearly it does want to be that and that's why i put a, a limit on how far i was going to play single player like i, I thought i'd do the first set of lieutenants of 50 and see what was that experience like and then that you know that is all i can say at the moment because i need to find people who want to play it with me to to try it out um but i i don't know it just feels like you know it is i i've got i've got cons- like it may well be gratifying if particularly if you're willing to maybe play it with some of the assists off and try and do it do it quote unquote properly but my my thought is that even in that scenario, I would probably still rather be playing like a structured mission, not yeah. an open world game. Mm-hmm. I'd rather, you know, I'd rather be playing. And I do have concerns about the meaningfulness of the challenge offered by the AI, um, who I just seem to just run around aimlessly if they're alerted. Like they don't appear to be able to find bodies, which is a pretty huge <laughs> stealth game thing. Fun like path. That's, that, I mean, that must be a decision rather than. I mean, like, like yeah like uh, it's a feature it's not, not a really a, it's like not... <laughs> bodies seem to vanish pretty quickly so oh, i don't do know they? if that's a right. thing yeah. but like i've definitely definitely like when i started playing i started playing with lots of stealth game logic in my head or like tactical action yeah. logic in my head like don't kill that one because there's buddy this, you'll see yeah. yeah like they see if you kill somebody obviously yeah but like i've definitely like killed someone on a patrol path and Can had a guard pick up the bodies no and had a guard like come back round and like walk over where that person had died and i couldn't see if the body had vanished or not so either the body had vanished or the guy didn't care which both of them as things are lame yeah so that that's you know i don't know that's why i would say like obviously with the caveat i do need to spend some time with it co-op but i feel like if 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 that's if the experience you want is of like um cooperative tactical action like there are much better games for that kind of thing tell me about like i don't i mean i tend to play multiplayer like with friends almost always i very rarely play yeah. online without friends it seems to me that a game like this a co-op game isn't what you would play with randoms no because you know it re- you, you got you got you got the the dullards and then the the super serious ones i mean, I mean it, it didn't it didn't are you talking about your friends yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it didn't it didn't it didn't work at all, all. Dull friends. like when uh, like the first time i connected to it um there were two of the people in the world you lose all your own squad mates and it's just you know they are your squad mates of them. one of them was just in a helicopter <laughs> hovering <laughs> afk good perfect and the other one was lying on a hillside in a zone that i didn't need to go to because i'd already done everything there just shooting the same people as they respawned and ran down a road forever. So when you when you when you when you squad up with randoms, they are just captured wherever they're at in the game. You get like a little indicator that says this person's roaming in this zone and this Across person's roaming the here. entire map of Bolivia. Yeah. yeah. So it like, uh, admittedly, like I didn't I didn't try and be like, hey guys, let's go do this mission. Hey, let's but, let's set up some sync kills. Like if it, if it had if it had dropped me in and there was a group of people doing stuff i would have happily played along and gone to do whatever it is they wanted to do and that's what i did is i you know i got in a helicopter and flew to the nearest human to see what are you doing and it's like oh you're just lying prone in the desert shooting at people what are you doing oh you're just at your fk oh, oh okay um so yeah no i mean this is what i mean about like got to get to the end of the rainbow which is actually playing it with friends for any like you know for, yeah. for a substantial amount of time and maybe 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 there it is good but it strikes me as a staggering investment, um, both in terms of their time and money and also the player's time and money for a experience that is possibly only good in a quite hard to arrange reliably 
circumstance yeah. you know like the thing is if it's only good in that circumstance and you've just sunk 50 quid into it then you're going to be the one badgering your mates to pick it up because it will be good it will be good yeah it will yeah be good. it's the ultimate owen hill that's game four. yeah i was gonna say, I was gonna and say. that's four times 50 quid yeah. you know yeah this is the thing like <laughs> i it feel I, it, i'm interested in the business case for that as opposed to doing something because it cheaper. could equally work the other way around yeah, i don't think i can like, talk my friends into it exactly so i won't bother so it's an instant trade-in for people on console and stuff like that it feels like yeah Mm. i mean i'd um, be interested to yeah i'd be interested like for somebody maybe in 10 years time to do a gdc talk of like the actual business logistics of that you know Mm. but i suppose ubisoft does know a little bit about those kind of ad hoc sort of Mm co-op things because of siege you know that that people do go into uh my, you know, um, but Siege is for that. more that they follow, like they followed Siege with For Honor. If you see what I mean, mm. like For Honor feels more like they've taken the financial learnings from Siege, whereas yeah. this feels like, oh shit, we just, you know, from what, what I've heard, what rather, we do a it feels like a now. generic kind of. Yeah, this. Well, this... we've had, we've got some systems. Let's just cobble them together and put some like Tom Clancy icing on the top, and it'll be fine. No one will know. It's... And like they got those two writers in who wrote like narco state thrillers, and it know. was just like, yeah, they, it's they um, some things. <laughs> it's interesting. Like it is a to- It's another throw all of the Ubisoft ideas in a bag and shake it and see what comes out of things like there's a little bit of steep you know the extreme sports game oh, yeah that was a, yeah that um was in its weird. dna as well because of the way the open worlds are structured and because you're encouraged to kind of like have fun getting everywhere do any mountains talk to you no you oh. can't ride any llamas i believe no. i remember that from, from Peru the press to briefing Texacana. three years ago yeah <laughs> Yep. Um, yeah, I mean, so <laughs> to, to say all of this is to actually kind of dance around one of the reasons that I initially completely hated it as well is, so the other, the other Ubisoft thing is their games are either quite nicely, gently, quietly progressive, um, as For Honor is, um, just in the sense of having the diverse cast of characters. Yeah, Assassin's and Assassin's Creed and yeah. stuff, yeah. Um, and Assassin's Creed has its moments. Um, uh, you know, even, even something like Siege, where it's certainly not the thrust of it, but like, you know, there's a diverse array of male and female operatives and sort of, you know well presented um and then on the other hand you have the occasional absurdly culturally insensitive ubisoft games like various far cries have been um and oh holy shit this is a poorly judged <laughs> act of fiction because one crucial thing that all of the games that it is want it wants to be do um from just cause to grand theft auto to crack down is they're very careful to fictionalize the stuff you're doing even if there's some real world commentary, GTA is not set in, you know, Los Angeles. It's set in Los Santos and there's a, you know, disconnect. Like yeah, there's, a, there's yeah. at least some disconnect. Like, yeah. um, uh, you know, um, just cause always invents its banana republics for purpose and they're always ludicrous and larger than life uh, because it suits this type of game, which is so much about kind of, yeah, play and messing around and blowing stuff up and it's easier to palette. That's more palatable when it's not trying to also be realistic. The Clancy thing is realism it's it's geopolitical believability yeah, real, yeah real shit and it's also it's always extremely paranoid and extremely right-wing and, and relies on the same couple of tropes over and over again a lot of the time but it's spy fiction you know it's sort of it, it goes to those places and and that is fine for splinter cell a lot of the time or rainbow six or even previous ghost recon games where they tell a kind of um like quite a a simple story or a subtle story? Well, usually the story is uh, there's a bunch of terrorists, yeah. kind of recognisable kind of geopolitical kind of terrorists threatening threatening the Western world. But then it undermines that with a... But actually, they're on the orders of, of, of groups within our own country. So it yeah, gets yeah. away with... It kind of does, you know, gets away with not being too jingoistic by kind of like ultimately apparently criticizing your own, you know. Yeah. The electricity was coming from the, inside the house all along. Yeah, indeed. Um, the spy electricity <laughs> yeah. was coming from the CIA. And like, yeah, and but so there's the backstory for Ghost Recon Wildlands, which I, uh, so partly this is, it's an accident of history, real history, uh, that this comes across as so poorly timed now as a, as a setup, but it's, so the idea, so the, the, the thing you're asked to take very seriously is the notion that a Mexican drug cartel gains so much power 
that it takes over the entire country of Bolivia to create a narco state. Um, and that the Bolivian government can't do anything about it. So they decide to just go with it or like, we'll go home. <laughs> You're yeah. going to want to go home. Good. Um, Leave. and, um, like all Bolivian people are just sort of wandering aimlessly from between town to villages doing going into a kind of cower animation loop whenever guns fire <laughs> and everywhere else is just a, a billion mexicans um with guns like your squad mates are pretty mean about that and kind of shitty about the entire thing and the you know the the intro to the game even has a sort of explicit big map and it uses the t- tom clancy traditional documentary footage and stuff to show how this is all pumping violence north into america and how South America has become this kind of yeah. hyper corrupt, hyper violent crime box that has to be contained by a C- by, by Bolivia. I don't know by a by a, a CIA an interventionary kind of CIA unit that gets sent in when things get really bad, and it is it it's such a strange um a strange thing to try and set in a real country when. 90% of the time you're crashing helicopters into stuff and kind of flipping things over. Um, but then on top of that, the unique among Clancy games, it also does go for like GTA's sense of humor. Like it's super grim all the time. And when I say GTA sense of humor, I mean specifically GTA five and like specifically that torture bit in GTA five. Like, you know, when they try and make a bit of a joke out of ripping someone's fingernails off and like that kind of thing. And it's like, Ew. like it's, it's weirdly gross. Like there, there are, there are, there are, are this party banter between the the roaming gang of murder twats that have entered Bolivia, um, and you hear this regardless of whether or not you're playing in co-op or not. Oh, what? So you're you're you're, you're human? Yeah. Kind of... Even if you're alone, <laughs> miles away from anyone else, you will have the banter, oh. and the banter will no escape from the. Banter. There's no escape on it, and the, they swear a lot, and there's a lot of like, you know. Is there, is, is like, one of them, could tell me about the, I mean, the characters, are they, is one of them kind of s- sort of, s- sort of, uh, South American or, no. you know, oh, no, really? In fact, I, you, you can create your own main character, um, and, um, I made a explicitly South American looking woman, hoping with cool tattoos and, you know, camo paint and stuff, hoping that the characters would be completely unvoiced, so then I could pretend <laughs> to be, like, Bolivian. And make this whole thing less shit. But, um, no, you, you're definitely, 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 definitely Americans. Um, you can have one of your face paint options is the Bolivian flag. If you want to really what blend in. What does that in. mean? <laughs> what does um, it mean? I don't know. Um, <laughs> but yeah, like you can, um, they talk about the weirdest shit. Like there's, and it's, it's kind of hard to explain. Like there's a lot of, there's a lot of talk about torture. There's a lot of barks about like, Essentially, there's another f- fucking Sicario gangster over there, you know, and like they use a lot of like Spanish, but like in a really kind of barbed way. Like it's, it's, it, it does, it teeters on the edge of openly quite racist quite a lot. Like the, there are funny radio DJs and big scare quotes. Like there's an extended bit about why South American women should be proud of their mustaches. I'm not fucking joking. That's in the game. <laughs> and they're, tr- they're trying to be edgy oh and it's a disaster. Like if it, the whole thing had been very deadpan Clancy, you, you got on board with it, but you just ignored it. But I keep having getting taken out of it by like, holy shit. They're like, trying to entertain you yeah. as opposed to pe- paint a kind of a yeah. believable picture or something. Yeah, it's, it is just... I mean, you, you know, I don't want to get too much into the, you know, it's not about should they, shouldn't they make it. It just seems tone deaf and tacky and kind of like, come on, guys. Like, because they're trying to be funny. That's the worst thing about it. They're not trying to show you the reality of the world. They're trying to make you kind of feel like it's all one big bants adventure. And it just doesn't work. You can't have that alongside that. This is this could really happen. Tom Clancy seriousness alongside you know, it, it sums up the game for me because it seems to be on one side wants to be GTA and on the other side it wants to be Rainbow Six. And it's just mashed those two things together without acknowledging the ways that open world design and co-op fight tactical action or can fight tactical action and the way that making it, telling it, trying to tell a story about real geopolitics 
clashes if you also want to have lots of edgy humor that's just going to come across as pointlessly offensive. So, yeah. In short. How many bands out of seven? Not a lot. No bands. No, no bands. Guy. <laughs> God. Um, yeah, no. Uh, so I'm going to give it a little bit more time, but I do think I might hate it. And it's rare for me to just bounce off a game like this, but yeah. Hmm. Mm. I think it's very much not aimed at you if it does have a target audience in mind. But it's from weird that Re- Ghost Recon has always felt like a sort of fairly. Uh, welcoming is entirely the wrong word. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, but in. A sort of a, well, not Tom not Feltz very is welcome, Matt. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, but not a very uh, characterful series. But mm. still, not one that had not a repellent one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, the last, the most recent thing they made was the free to play shooter set in um, the future. Yeah, was that Phantoms? Is that what that was called? I think it was called Ghost Recon Phantoms, because I'm pretty sure the word ghost was in the title twice. <laughs> um, <laughs> bless him. Yeah, it was, like, yeah, Ghost Recon Phantom Spectre. Yeah. Um, um, and like, that was a pretty harmless third person free to play yeah. sh- shooter set in the future because all modern military shooters were set slightly in the future a couple of years ago. And this is obviously the new thing they've decided to do with the license. I don't know, it just seems, strangely misjudged to me i think it's just one of those things where from or not just but like from what you've said like i just wonder whether they've decided to court and i i'm gonna be so careful with how i phrase this because i don't want to just like trample into a hornet's nest but like the sense from everything that you've said is that perhaps they have a target demographic in mind that is fine with both that sort of lazy shock jock nonsense humor in air quotes but also sort of like that doesn't see it problematically sitting alongside a sort of wannabe serious Geopoli- do you know mm. what I mean? Like it, it You're saying feels... that it plays well to a post Trump America. But, <laughs> yeah, I think I think or, it, I think or it... at least an immature one. Yeah. Like it, it feels like by the time you start thinking about whether those are ducks that can exist in a row, mm. like it, it you would maybe just be pleased to have the serious thing and some funny bits and to share it with your friends. Yeah, you know? yeah, yeah. Oh yeah, like yeah. I think I, I you know I, you can see the business case. I can see the business case. I, I, I think it's a, a shit business case, and they should be ashamed to have made a bad video game. But like, oh, it's Canadians as well. It's Toronto, wasn't it? Uh, Paris. Oh, was it? Yeah. Hmm. Well, Not that, that tells you anything. It's even more left. <laughs> well, we'll find out. Um, yeah, you know, I mean, yeah, just. <laughs> That wasn't to stick up for it at all. I'm just no, no. Sort of, I mean, I'm interested in why one would make. Yeah, I, th- I think it's uh, yeah. I, I, I certainly think, you know, I don't. I don't believe anyone involved in it necessarily thought ill. I think it's. I think maybe we're maybe just getting a bit more used to games being slightly more thoughtful about that stuff, mm. and this level of like total kind of head in the sand this can't possibly have any real world associations because I believe the government of Bolivia is suing them. Like, that's interesting. Like, (laughs) yeah, like it's not gone unnoticed. Mm. Um, and it feels like I, either a very cynical thing to have done or a very naive thing to have done that you can just say, take a country and go, Hey, yeah. Like if GTA decided to suddenly be set in a real city and present it as Cardiff or something. Yeah. Cardiff. And just prevent it as, um, irre- irredeemably crime ridden and, and, you know, like, I think that would upset people. Maybe it wouldn't. I don't know if, if crime is a different thing. Or, uh, it's hard to figure out the parameters of that. It's hard to figure out why this feels so kind of weird and egregious. But I think maybe it's because it leans on its, on its relevance so hard only to then tell you that Bolivia is entirely populated by Mexican drug dealers, which is just kind of, 
bit mad. Like if it was if it was cartoonish and silly with it, you wouldn't necessarily notice because it's so desperate to convince you that it's talking hard talk about mm. torture and. But it feeds into really damaging stereotypes. Yeah. That are yes. having real world repercussions, and it's worth pulling them up on it in a way that it isn't necessarily worth pulling people up on every like awful stereotyped to the point of borderline racist sort yeah. of thing that they might do in creative media. That's that's the thing that I think they probably couldn't have planned for is that you know there was no no knowing when this game was put started being put together maybe three or four years ago that yeah, I think it's quite, it's that, quite that would become a time. a political football that would you know that, that you know that you know that making a game where your kind of wacky fictional conceit is that you know South America is a you know, hive of of criminality that needs to be put down by America would suddenly become a really uncomfortable political thing, rather than simply another fantasy setting. Like, oh God, the Soviets have got a EMP again. They like- could have reskinned it though. They could have made like the country be all like snow and ice and stuff and then they could have changed all of the people into penguins mm. and then mm. they could have just made it like ghost recon antarctica yeah mm. i'd mm. played that it yeah. could be scientists taking over exactly scientists. like the penguins are just like fuck this shit no mm. we're mm. you know and then the pe- the scientists would be in their bases and mm. in their research stations and the penguins would be like scoping them out and trying to like fuck with them and like makes a lot get rid sense. of them yeah this would be good yeah, i indeed. don't understand why i'm not writing for this game <laughs> tom clancy's club penguin yeah <laughs> <laughs> license is free now after indeed all. yeah mm. quite well not sure that how, that's how ip works but it's club penguin island mm. now isn't it <laughs> <laughs> so oh. yes anyway th- those are my thoughts on ghost recon i probably won't return to it um in future pods but i'll be interested to see because i know that people have enjoyed it and i know that it's received some very good reviews and i don't understand so maybe be interested to hear from people who maybe have had a different experience with it or or genuinely are enjoying it shall we do questions from questions yes alex yes yes the questions okay the questions first question comes from alex wasn't me though it wasn't different a different one what history podcasts would you recommend it's a nice getting off good topic uh, thing. Mm. OT. Yeah. <laughs> I like You Must Remember This. I like You Must Remember This as well. That is about the golden age of Hollywood. Mm. And sometimes the uh, the researcher, host, narrator, lady Karina Longworth does accents which mm. are... Sometimes good and sometimes less good, but I really love that she just goes for it. The only time I have not she been glad... She researches it so yeah, well. The research well. is phenomenal and the insight into a really interesting part of our cultural history is, is great. The only time I have not been glad that she does accents or voices for people is during the extended and otherwise very good series on Charles Manson. Because <laughs> it's about the history of Hollywood in, in a broader cultural sense as well. And, you know, <laughs> that is a sort of defining moment in the history of of the 60s and the you know the latter half of the 20th century in terms of Hollywood's perception of itself it's a brilliant piece of documentary writing and journalism wasn't the time to do voices <laughs> uh, <laughs> just wasn't the time for it um we just say that it's probably the worst example to bring up on of what was otherwise a really great Podcast yeah, I should probably not have said that because, like, it was more just because I was listening to it this afternoon and I had her impression of someone stuck yeah. in my head. She has a uh, a cigar chomping movie mogul voice. I love that, that she voice. does for people like Louis B. Mayer and and things like that. But when that comes out during the kind of the more serious moments, <laughs> <laughs> but it's a great. It's a, it's a really great. Podcast. But yeah, those are really really good. Um, and yeah, like what else? I listen to the Dan Carlin. Uh, hardcore history stuff but mm. sometimes it's a bit much especially when i find him sometimes a bit grating so like some of the podcasts last about like five hours and a multi-part things and it's like they're again they're really well researched there's loads of context there's loads of quotes it's really sort of 
um thought provoking a lot of the time and he'll add in a lot of like information about his own biases or like where the sources are from and all of that kind of stuff and it's fascinating stuff but just occasionally it's just too much for yeah. for like one sitting so i'll sort of nibble away at it for a while mm. um so there are those i'm trying to think what else there is i'm just gonna look on my i like um telephone 99 percent invisible mm. which is oh, yeah. design but it's usually historically led really mm, um, that's true telling about why things are like they are mm. um and so, yeah, me and uh, Marsh Davies have a little thing. Uh, uh, well, one of one or other of us will listen to In Our Time. So it's obviously this is like radio program, but it's available as a podcast. And uh, we'll compare um, appreciation for uh, um, Melvin's cl- sort of throaty kind of noises, kind of clearings of throats <laughs> and sort of strange kind of outbursts and things <laughs> and his general mental state as well he often be sometimes he'll be really ratty during a episode and he'll kind of hurry people along where he feels that they're not saying their pieces clearly enough and quickly enough that's always a nice little kind of counterpoint to some often quite uh impenetrable subjects <laughs> <laughs> oh wow uh, yeah like that sounds that does sound good. I also, like, I'm just looking at my phone and I've got things like, they're sort of, they're not history, they're history adjacent. So it's stuff like law, which is about sort of folklore or like um, urban legends or, you know, like just the sort of the stories that have accreted that are kind of a bit creepy or a bit weird or a bit, yeah, like... Um, I don't like listening to it when I'm in the house on my own. (laughs) (laughs) Um, and the other one is just the myths and legends podcast. And so that, again, that's, you know, very much focused on the myths and legends and fables and fairy tales and things like that. Um, but it's really well told and sort of, again, tries to think critically about sources and, and things like that. And so they're both just sort of good for for that kind of thing in terms of i don't really listen to a lot of like pure history though i don't think i've always i mean one of the first podcasts i really got into was the history of rome which i presume is still available it's oh, a yeah. very very long podcast yeah. series it's very good uh, that's a good accompaniment to your sunday of playing civ or total war or something like that yeah, and I think there are a few natural history podcasts that I have subscribed to at various points in time, mm. but none that spring to mind right now. Frank writes, Greeting, Greetings, Pip and Crowboys. Oh! I was listening to Chris and Tom's back and forth about Tides of Numenera on last week's pod, and I found myself intrigued by all this talk about what consciousness even is. The idea of a morality system, which is actually as vague and complex and layered as morality in real life, also piqued my interest. On the other hand, I already have Planescape Torment, but I'm one of those people who never made it out of the mortuary. Perhaps I'm too much of an ADD kind of person for such a slow-paced and text-heavy game. So do I buy this game and just barrel through the tedium because the subject matter fascinates me, or do I just watch a playthrough or cutscene montage or something? Or should I perhaps give Planescape Torment another try first and see how I do with that? Also, wouldn't this game work better if it was a book? Keep on podding, Frank. So uh, there's a lot of no answers to this question, I think, for me. Um, <laughs> what is the mortuary? Is that, does the, that just it, mean it's, that it's he the first get area? Very far? Yeah. It's the first oh, okay. area in, it's where you wake up at the beginning of Planescape Torment. So. And it's pretty, cam, it's a, it's a pretty complicated and sort of, it's a hard start. I'd yeah, say. yeah. Norman Numenera has an easier start than that. It eases you into more gently. Norman era. Norman era. Norman <laughs> era. A Norman era. Um, That's a podcast, maybe. Yeah. Like a history podcast. It's the opposite of the uh, Battle of Hastings. <laughs> <laughs> that was a Norman success. In the get- Norman era. In the Norman era. <laughs> <God>. Stop it. <laughs> Brought about the beginning of the Norman era. <laughs> This is what happens when we have an actual dad on the podcast. Ooh, you embrace your natural dadness. Yeah. 
Oh dear. Oh, I, I need. Oh. To, I think I need a shower after that. <laughs> just this wash is, away the dadness. This is what our bubble game was like. It was just hours of. I like that you've managed to blame it on Alex when it entirely came from you. Yeah. <laughs> he wasn't involved. <laughs> So, oh yeah, this is what happens when we have a dad. Yeah, I'm just no, trying to find something to pin it on. Um, <laughs> fine. Um, so, um, to answer those questions in reverse order. Um, no, no. Yeah. No. Would this game work better if it is a book? No, because it's fundamentally about player choice and about your personal sense of what's going on and your personal, uh, particularly because it has no clear cut morality. Um, it only works because you are able to position yourself within that and see the reactions and have your actions challenged. So no, it wouldn't. Um, should I give Planescape Torment another try to see how I do with that? Not a terrible idea, but I do think that Tides of Numenera is a easier way into this kind of thing. And it's a standalone thing. You you really don't need to play. Yeah, they're, they're only they're only thematically Torment. linked to each other. Yeah. Um, should I watch a playthrough or a cutscene montage? No, that's actually going to be worse. Well, there's no, there are no cutscenes, so that's one thing. So you can't watch a cutscene montage. Um, uh, watching someone else's playthrough is going to give you the worst possible experience of that game because it is so much about sort of in- intuition and interpretation and interiority and other things to do with int. Um, you know, Tom Senior put it really well on the last pod when he said that it's, all, it's, you know, the reason it's so heavily written is because it is all about the process of coming to an understanding of things and and reading and understanding and then making a decision watching someone else just make the decision part is not going to tell you anything about the game whatsoever um so with that in mind should you should you buy it anyway the reason i don't think you should is because of the phrase should i buy it and just barrel through the tedium <laughs> and it's like if if the reading and the the making decisions and the walking around talking to people is tedium, then don't play it because that that is the game. game. That is you know it's like, and you also if you don't enjoy that stuff, you won't get much out of it. So you won't even get the thing that people are talking about. And that's not you know it's not it's not the fault of any given player. It's just you have like so the the counterpoint to that we have another question coming up from someone who didn't think they would like it and really did. Um. For precisely the same reason. So I don't want to say no, definitely not. But like, if it, if the notion of like really genuinely, truly having to read and think about all of the text is off putting, then don't play it. Cause it's not an RPG where you can just skip to the bit where you fight the goblins. Like the reading is the action. So is there anything that you can think of, like maybe a game, but also maybe a film or a book that explores the similar subject matter to what the the person who emailed him found interesting but that wouldn't obviously involve playing this mm, particular good game question um let me think it draws from a lot of like 70s sci-fi so there's books like um isn't that inferio by jack vance it's a, it's a good fantasy novel anyway. That might be an interesting... It's not exactly the same themes, really, but it's got some uh, similar kind of notions and atmosphere mm-hmm. to it. Um, let me think. Uh, you could read the Numenera core books. Um, they are certainly a thing to do, but that's, that is that is definitely more reading. Um, <laughs> I don't think films that are, have some of the same themes... Ideas of identity and power and the kind of the use and abuse of of that influence and power is, is tricky. Like the big themes, but not in the specific configuration. Mm. Um, in terms of what it means to be conscious, which is, you know, a theme, I'm not sure. Sounds more like philosophy. I mean, that's or the religion. thing, though, is like it, this series stands out because it's I mean, it's very distinctive. Yeah, yeah. That's I mean, that is. you know, a lot of its ideas do fit into the bit in Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy where the whale materializes out of nowhere in the sky. Everyone remember that bit, Hitchhiker's Guide? 
Vaguely. Um, Cru- two cruise time. missiles, one of them turns into a plant pot, oh, the other yeah. one turns into a sperm whale. Yep. Yeah. Um, and the sperm whale goes through its entire process of figuring out what it is as it plummets to Earth. No? All right, well, that's basically the plot, plot of <laughs> Tom and Tanzania. So, um, oh, okay. like, I mean, I, to he the extent... a whale? But, n- n- no. Oh. But to the extent that I think the intro I'm to... I'm not to, interested. I, uh, to the extent that I think the first scene in Torment is an explicit reference to that. Because if, if it isn't, then it's weird that... that yeah, because it's why are they talking yeah. about sperm whales? Not exactly. <laughs> um, so I think probably not. And that's a shame because I do love that game. But... It's okay. That's it's okay. You know, it's okay to not. I mean, I don't say it in my review. Like, I love this, but for fuck's sake, don't buy this if you don't want to read. Because you know, and it is cheap. perfectly fine that you don't want to read. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Uh, Dan writes, "Hello, CNC. This one is potentially for the Grudge book. I've become increasingly fed up with games making me kill animals for reasons, crafting, or whatever bullshit they can think of. It's something that's always made me feel uncomfortable. But as games have gotten bigger and more realis- more realistic, I find it harder and harder to enjoy games like Far Cry, Assassin's Creed." And most recently, Dragon Age Inquisition, where killing animals is required to progress. I know killing people is not much different, but usually they're shooting at me and I want to make them stop. So why do I have to murder a bear minding its own business? How do you feel about video game animal murder? Thanks, as always, for the great pod, and kudos especially for last week's surprise pod from The Void. It was great to hear from Marsh, Tom especially. Pip was a delight, as usual. Aww. Regards, Dan. That's nice. Most of the bears and stuff in... um. Far Cry are fairly homicidal. Mm. They they give you a reason to kill them. I must say, uh, <laughs> I've been playing the New Zelda, and um, it feels weird to play. I mean, obviously, in Zelda, you do in previous games, you do just kill everything, but usually all those things are hostile. And mm. the, but this is teeming with wildlife, like little squirrels and stuff um, mm. rushing about, and um, and it does feel weird that the game is perfectly happy if you've slaughtered them and gives you the reason because they drop food. <laughs> so um, that feels weird and I do know what you were talking about. Mm. I think I just, I don't really. Sometimes I'm not sufficiently involved in the game or the game's universe that I mind. So for example, certainly at the beginning of the game, if I'm just flailing my sword around or whatever and I happen to catch a few animals in the <laughs> in the uh in the in the spin, then I'm not bothered about it. But then like if I if I'm sufficiently into the game where I, I'm i myself a bit more or I'm a bit more vulnerable or a bit more chill, then suddenly it does become a different prospect. And, I mean, I find this when I play most games is that I just sort of... It doesn't occur to me to try and fuck with the wildlife. Mm. Like, I, I don't go over and just start, like, Wailing. hitting a shrew or, you know, whatever else one might do you i don't even have the terminology for this <laughs> wailing on a shrew wailing you did on randomly shrew. hit that old man in zelda yeah but that was different that's a human <laughs> so it does he was feel... giving me sass <laughs> but when i suppose when it comes to sort of defenseless animals it feels feels like sort of video games or games kind of reliance on violence as an expression or one of the few expressions that you have in the game suddenly feels sort of it kind of starts to show up that you don't have petting in it yeah. you know like what what other things can you do in the game that express it like that, that you can interact with these creatures that doesn't involve kind of thwacking them you there know there are a few like no man's sky lets you you know feed, feed animals and yeah. things and then they'll follow you around and you can sort pet of... them you can tame yeah. and pet them in far cry primal which mm. is and petting a saber-toothed tiger is and there's nice. like there's other bits and pieces like in uh one of the things in tacoma was when i was scrubbing backwards and forwards through one of the scenes um there's a little cat that's asleep in the corner on a chair and you know it's sort of like it, it moves a little bit but it you know it never vacates its comfy spot and stuff and, and that's just quite endearing and mm. nice and and you know you start feeling fond of that stuff but i think sometimes like so much is also dependent on how the game treats the animals because i find myself quite unnerved if the game has gone to all the trouble of or the developers rather have gone to all the trouble of 
you know, making something look really lifelike, but then just treat it as, you know, flesh currency or, you know, uh, crafting materials or something. That's creepy because it's like, here's this absolutely beautiful thing that we've tried really hard to produce in our game. And now you hit it until it dies and gives you, you know, currency in some form. Mm. Um, and similarly in other games, the, you know, just the, the method of killing something is brutal enough that it's, it, 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 it's a step beyond, you know? Whereas in others, it's like, okay, well, you're just working your way up from killing a small thing or dealing with a small problem up until, you know, whatever else. Like I remember when I was playing fable 2 and it was like one of your first quests is to just clear some um beetles out of a dungeon you know and it's it's more just because it's a it represents something smaller and yeah. then you ramp up to sort of human conflict i guess so it's i don't know like it's presented in a lot of different ways it doesn't mean it's presented well very often but it's i i don't know yeah it is complicated in some ways what i do been... like to do with animals <laughs> in games <laughs> um I, i'm really not like i'm not a big fan of uh, bolted on crafting systems um and i'm so i'm kind of with this questioner on that but not something i'm tremendously bothered about like i tend to leave them alone so, I think yeah. the thing that bothers me more related to animals in games is just that oftentimes a game will have animal or nature sounds as part of its soundtrack, but then they won't be accompanied by anything living in the yeah, actual yeah. world. <laughs> so you'll go through this forest with like amazing oh, bird sounds and animals. crickets and whatever else. And Life's then it's like, around you, know, and you look around and it's like a few sticks and you're like, yeah. well brilliant you know like although that's I, the... I was walking through a little <laughs> forest in that. zelda earlier on and um there was there was a really insistent kind of bird call and it's the kind of game where you think there is a bird there to be found and i bet there's going to be an owl it. that knows everything and is probably a pain is, yeah. in the ass <laughs> yeah, a pain in the ass owl probably a guardian of something <laughs> <laughs> do me a favor <laughs> fine help owl <laughs> And then it'll like flap off in a sort of regal outrage, leaving some feathers behind you. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, uh, my mind just went to a strange place then. Really? Yeah. Oh. Uh, I mean, uh, a sexy place. No, I, I help for owl some place. reason, no, a help owl place took me to. Um, <laughs> uh, you can be my bodyguard and I could be your long lost owl. And <laughs> that is just playing on loop in my head because I'm very tired. <laughs> Poor Chris. Or you can call me Owl, and that was. <laughs> oh God! Um, it's all a bit I'm much. glad you pressed that. <laughs> yeah. Sorry. Um, <laughs> Kane writes. Let's move on. Kane writes. Stop. Thirteen years, five months, and twenty-five days ago, ish, Steam was first launched. It'd be four years before it sprouted a store, and even longer before a strange cult formed around a worshiping, a knife-wielding beard man from Microsoft. Back then, it was just a competitor for GameSpy's server browser, and everyone hated it. What fact about the games industry today would your 2003-era self refuse to believe? Also, how many days after the launch of Steam was your account created? Regards, Kane. So, we can do the last part first. My Steam account was created late January 2004, so... That's ancient. Yeah. I'm, I'm, I'm ashamed to say mine's only nine years old. Same... Same. Babies, it's cool. We're cool. My Steam yeah. account's a teenager. No, it's because we're young. You? Oh, Hotmail's probably what? my oldest internet account. Yahoo, maybe. Uh, For me, I don't think I've got many of my really old internet accounts anymore. My Gmail's old, as old as the Gmail beta, whenever that was. Yeah. Oh, those are the days. That day we got. Oh, Do you remember code. Google Wave? <laughs> no. <laughs> really? Was that is that an old person thing? Yeah, Google Wave was. Oh god! Don't say it's an old person bizarre. thing. Yeah, but also like I think we might not it understand be their it now. Next big thing. <laughs> it was like this working platform, but only only three people at Google used. And you could were... like wave. So like, what was the wave part of I can't it? Remember. I can't remember. I I, si I think I signed up to it. There was a lot of excitement, yeah. wasn't there? I was as well. Like, oh, I'm on the beer. 
Um, I thought of a thing. I thought yeah. of a. Um, so, uh, Sega was quite big back in 2003. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Dreamcast had failed by that point, but you know, these days Dreamcast of, didn't fail. It, it went was a home. noble. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, these days, one of Sega's biggest, you know, um, properties is Total War. Mm. Total War. I think the thing for me would be, to, I think my my then sixteen year old self wouldn't conscience. MMOs aren't going to get any better than this. <laughs> You're living in a golden age. Really? Guild Wars 2 is very good. Yeah. That's still... Well, Star had promise. Years. It was still standing. But they were all the Martin. same game. Yeah. 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 Like, when, uh, when, when I was that age, I thought we were going to get... I thought I thought MMOs were just going to get more and more complicated and more I mean, deeper and deeper and more and more immersive. But No. Because 2003 was the arrival of World of Warcraft, and that was the yeah. beginning of the end. The uh, <laughs> and then I, I suppose you could say for like what, what's the, like one of the big years for open world games, like where they kind of really blew open, like GTA 2000 and, uh, GTA 3 coming out or something like that, and 2009. Yeah, yeah. That, something like that. Yeah, and then open world games didn't really. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Really... It's just more of this. <laughs> Yeah. Mm. I didn't see myself working in games. Yeah, I was going to be a linguist. Mm. <laughs> I mean, you know. You do language. Uh, yes. Well, I mean, yeah. <laughs> in t- 2003, I was pretty sure I was going to be a rock star. That didn't pan out. It turns out that you can't just decide that you're in Led Zeppelin. It's not a thing you can do. Well, Led Zeppelin aren't very popular nowadays, are they? <laughs> <laughs> Look, all right. Some complex emotions out. went over his <laughs> face. <laughs> to say, like, it's all about Ed Sheeran, really. Isn't it? I went into HMV today. <laughs> Craig David's making a resurgence. Yeah, he is, Indeed, yeah. yeah, but you know, you really pinned your horse to the wrong car. Fusty old <laughs> cart wagon. I don't wow. Know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you, I was in HMV today and they're apparently making all the staff wear those Ed Sheeran t-shirts that Ed Sheeran wears. What's that? I think it's for his new album or Does something. Does it just have his name on it? The man looked very unhappy. Does he work yeah, there? I think so. photograph of himself. Yeah. There was a good photo of him wearing his own t-shirt, yeah. Bless him. How do you know what Ed Sheeran looks like? I. He's kind of funny looking, isn't um, he? On the internet. I don't know. What's your I'll put it. I'll put it this way. If Ed Sheeran... If Ed Sheeran was the guy before you, you uh, waiting for an interview at E3, you wouldn't bat. Yeah, it is him. He's the one I'm thinking of. Yeah, because I think I saw on um, I use Apple Music and there was they do these kind of interviews and there's Zane Lowe. I think Zane mm. Lowe yeah. kind of does these interviews with musicians and Zane Lowe is very kind of it's he's a he's a potentially rugged looking kind of sort of cool dude and then there's <laughs> then there's E3 journalists wow, I think I just got older <laughs> then there's E3 journalists oh beside him yeah yeah like I tend not to I'm always looking for the lion chest tattoo whenever Ed Sheeran is around so I'm just I think I I've I mean, started not, chest pit, not I mean, remembering what he, he looks like because mm. I'm just looking at the lion hmm. no, maybe that's is it big Oh, it's enormous, and I photoshop it onto other things. He doesn't look like he'd have a big tattoo. Oh, and yet. <laughs> <laughs> I will show you pictures later. <laughs> We've all learned something about Ed Sheeran today. Which I think was what um, what was the, the question, question was what, about, really. Yeah, what <laughs> fact about the game? In 2003, that... do you think that you would have asked a question which would have yeah. mounted it in quite a lot of information about Ed Sheeran? Yeah. Well... You're going to play out your 20s, have a conversation about Ed Sheeran's chest tattoo on the games podcast that you No, I didn't do really in your foresee office. any of that. No. I mean, I didn't really make a plan, so maybe it was my own fault. Mm. I mean, I've... When I was about six or seven, I decided I was going to be a maths teacher, and every deviation wow. from that has just gone. Every in deviation the big book of yes, every standard deviation. Oh, it's a joke! One. I don't understand. No, but it has gone in the big book of grudges. To be honest, yep. 
This is the pamphlet of grudges back then. Well, it's just incomprehensible to me how, how this happened. <laughs> and how it's still happening. It's just, it's just <laughs> happening to me still. Every day I wake up and it's happening. <laughs> And it's not going to stop until I read a different question. Oh. Noel writes, Hi, gang. Hello. I bought Torment, Tides of Numenera, almost immediately after I read Chris's review. And I've been loving it. This is unusual because I don't get on well with slow, thinky, reedy games, regardless of quality. Because I get b- bored of clicking and reading. But what is the most unexpectedly great recommendation of a game anyone has ever given you? Cheers, Noel. So I was going to mention... So it wasn't necessarily a huge recommendation, but it wasn't someone else's prompting. The game I thought I would hate and then didn't was Dota 2. And I won't bang on about why I like Dota 2 too much because God knows you've heard that before. But that's probably the most surprised I have been. To why genuinely did you think you wouldn't like it? Because I was never good at... I played a lot of Warcraft and Starcraft and found it extremely stressful. Um, I... I li- like I liked it, but I, I found it, you know, hmm. I, I with all those games, I always get to a point where I realised that I sucked, and I didn't find that gratifying. Um, and I thought of those kind of free to play character driven things as like a huge time and money sink. Uh, that just like that they existed in my head in the same space as browser strategy games and you know, pure time drains that, you know, what you use up time, you could be playing a real game. And I imagine there are people who think they'll worry about Dota now, but they're wrong, basically, because it's amazing. But back then I was, I was young. I was naive. It's my most played game on Steam. Mm. You've got like over 2,000 hours on it. Yeah. And same. the next one behind that is Adventure Capitalist with 550. 550 hours. <laughs> yeah. Lordy. I mean, I just leave it going in the background. So, you know. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> but yes, oh well. Anything spring to mind, Alex? No, I, I, no, not really. No, I've kind of... I tend to have a good handle on yeah. what I do like and why I like it. Like, um, if a friend recommends something to me earnestly, I'll give it a go and... I tend to go into things hoping that I do like them Mm. and wanting to see what the other person sees in them. And then it tends to be that it still, if, if it was a thing that I wouldn't have picked up for myself, it still doesn't seem to resonate. Mm. And so I, I, I think I have probably been surprised by things, but there are far more occasions where i've sort of been proven not right but it 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 shows me that i have an understanding of why i don't like the things that i'm not interested in i'm sort of i'm quite catholic like you know that sort of i'm just interested in all the games and so when the recommendation is like oh yeah probably would like you know quite interesting Mm. i mean like for instance i have no interest in football i don't play fifa very much but if someone says let's play FIFA, I will enjoy playing FIFA with mm. them because mm. most games are like that, you know, that with the right person and the right context and that kind of thing, most things can be reasonably good unless they're terrible. You know? Yeah. Yeah, I think it's like 4X and stuff. Like sometimes people are like, oh, you know, try, well, why don't you try this one? Or I think this one might be a good sort of entry point. Mm. And I'm like, I mean, I'll, I'll give it a go and I'll sort of look for the things that you've, specifically highlighted but like it it does always seem to result in this genre just still isn't for me and i'm still Mm. not finding a way in and you know it's yeah it's one of those things where i I sort of try really hard to be like accepting or open-minded or to look for the things that someone is describing as fun so i don't think it's me being having preconceptions it really is a kind of i just don't like some kinds of games and that's okay Mm. (laughs) finally jens writes dear crt and crwbr 
With March now upon us, the time has finally come when we can look back at and entirely objectively summarise the past year, free from the haze and buzz of New Year's Eve. As I recall, 2013 and 2014 were dubbed the year of the bow and the boat, respectively, with 2015 being called the first great year of small games that knew exactly what they were. What labels would you find folk bestow upon 2016? My nomination would be the year of the big budget sequels improving upon yet still selling worse than their predecessors, Titanfall, Dishonored, Watch Dogs, and Deus Ex. P.S. The, pro- the module installation tool for the Python programming language is called PIP, and every time I have to type a phrase like PIP, install pandas, I can't help but smile. I would install pandas. Yes, you would. <laughs> That's the sort of thing and I would how. happily do. <laughs> That's how. Thanks for making walking to work on Monday morning something to look forward to. Yay! Um, so this sort of, I actually think that his assertion that the year of the well-intentioned sequel didn't sell very well is actually a pretty solid. Yeah, it's really good because it's yeah. Call of Duty and yeah. Infinite Warfare as well. Um, um, you and I, uh, Far, Far Cry Primal. Yeah, yeah. Jesus. Yeah, there's a, like a. I think very quietly there's a a supernova going on in the kind of upper game industry. Um, I think a lot of people are, I think things aren't as steady and set. I'd be really interested to see what happens in what to wildlands, for instance. Yeah, for sure. Mm. I think, um, year of the, uh, time travel level. Yeah. I was thinking that I, so there's Titanfall two. Yeah. We can talk about this now, right? Yeah. Two. Yeah. But I don't, I'm sure there's another game from that year, but I can't think what it is. What was the boat? What was this boat that happened? No, 2014 was like Assassin's Creed Black mm-hmm. Flag, wasn't it? Oh, right, yeah. But that's only one boat. There was lots of boats for a year. There was a year of... The... I can't think of any more boats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I'm pretty sure there was a year with loads of boats. Ah. Uh... There's a year of, of dogs and dads as well. Last year it was a very <laughs> dadsy year. Dad year. <laughs> it was a very dadsy year in games. Uh. Um, prominent dads of last year include Corvo. Yeah. I think this is my problem is that I don't really play AAA games much. Mm. Like I'll kind of keep an eye on it, but I won't play them to know the trends. Like I could probably tell you that quite a lot of pleasing procedural generation gardening games came out on itch but you know that's probably not going to be a a broadly (laughs) (laughs) accepted standard (laughs) definition for the year i don't think i've got my my finger in the barometer of (laughs) finger in the barometer (laughs) careful with all the mercury (laughs) don't put the mercury in your sandwich you really pinned the barometer to the horse there. Oh, it's been a long day. <laughs> it's been a really long day. I started work at 3am. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of eye rubbing going on. Yeah, so, I mean, the... <laughs> this may ter- come across. In terms of 2016, I'm trying to think, because what were the themes that linked those games beyond simply how they, they fared? Um as kind of commercial, you know, um, projects. I don't know, really. I, I thought we might be heading to the year of the weird black goo for a while. Mm, well, I would go Prey. Prey um, features in Deus Ex because of the kind of smoke tentacle monster stuff that Emily can do. But that's sort of spread out over time and limited to Arcane and their current interest in... <laughs> it's very league. specific. Yeah. Um, so I'm not sure, really. Um, we we kind of had, in some ways, like, there was quite a lot of buddies. You know, BT in Titanfall. And... Oh, yeah. So, uh, me- a, a duo male relationships. Yeah. Because that, uh, yeah, because you had the fours. We get back in. Actually, wasn't there that time, uh, in the kind of late OOs where, um, because all the games tried to do the bud, you know, the co op games, like so, and they would shoehorn in a second player. Mm. And so all the levels would have two mounted guns next to each other. So both, both players could have a little go together. Yeah, yeah. Really and then, tragic. And that you were buddy. Playing yeah. two players. <laughs> Yeah. Just like, ooh. <laughs> ooh, ooh. Sad, sad turret. 
<laughs> so maybe we're just getting it. You know, that's swinging back round again. Mm. Beautiful. Good days. Great yeah, days. Yeah, yeah. Just... It's co-op buddy time of day, time again. Well, in the year, of course, that um, Gears of War 4 came out. Gears of War was 4. It, oh, hang on, was that Gears of War. last year? It was, yeah, it was also year. the year that VR very much didn't happen, despite the industry being very yeah. pleased for it to happen. Yeah. Mm. So I don't, But I don't think you can characterise something by a lack, really, can you? A space. <laughs> it's like, oh, well... <laughs> Like, I think just because the games weren't there. Like, yeah. there's really interesting projects, but there isn't a a, a reason to, to must have it unless you are making... They sold those, well, though. Like, VR, VR's install base is pretty, mm. pretty big. I wonder how many people, like, are A, still using theirs, and B, what they use it for. You know, whether it's for the, you know, the big screen sort of like movie watching or for you know like just playing regular games but in that headspace maybe i genuinely don't know i mean i know that like i i don't know if i necessarily even agree that vr's failed because like i'm not saying that it was failed i was saying that last year it felt like the industry was very much pushing for it to happen and happen now Mm. but it didn't and it's going to be deferred until people sort of figure that out yeah i i would be interested to know what um it happening means um because like the ps vr had has like sold like a million pieces of hardware and it's hard to get hold of one yeah now um you know uh, both both the oculus and the vive sold in the hundreds of thousands but i would i would remind you that like connect sold 20 something million right very, very quickly. Still being used as well for developing particular experiences and other research projects yeah. and things. It's a really interesting a piece of And it enabled Star Wars. There's a bit connect. of a curio or a shortcut to something. But the thing is, I think the connect kind of, like, wait to, to use the terminology from before, like, I think for me, VR will happen when it figures out what it is and is happy with that, if you see what I mean. Like, Mm. when we collectively come to an understanding of what it is and what we are and aren't waiting for it to do. And I think at the moment, sort of, there's that... It feels like there's a collective sort of waiting for the game that makes it make sense or the bigger experience that makes it make sense. Whereas if it's going to be a thing where you can connect to people in very specific ways or have very specific experiences or even that it's a thing that isn't good f- particularly for gaming but is good for other types of media or other types of project, then I, th- I think it'll just be about figuring that out. I think we need to figure out what it does well and how we use it well. Yeah, I agree. Because I think, I think a lot of people are kind of you know because a lot of the the art experiences are about linear storytelling and well it's about like just translating stuff yeah into... and that a lot of but i think there's no real social kind of understanding in the mainstream of kind of uh, putting on a vr headset to have a story told to you or you know I like you might watch a film that i've seen that's been the most interesting has been art projects or it's been like meditation things or like there was uh there's stuff that like sound self that is about sort of you create a meditation loop between your voice and what you see on screen and um that's very much a, a kind of uh, it's very difficult to describe experience and it involves getting into a very particular mindset and I fell asleep while playing it which wasn't the wrong thing to do but it's a it's a different thing um and the uh the stuff that I was talking about earlier with Isaac Cohen's work like that's very sort of um it's very hard to tell people about it and to come away like you feel like you've explained it yeah adequately and things like that so i yeah but those are all experiences that use space in an interesting way or that use the specific feedback systems that you can create in an interesting way whereas you know sort of holding a 
touch controller in my hand and clicking to teleport to over there and then throwing a thing that that doesn't feel like it has the same delight or the same anything that makes that experience something that i want to have in vr as opposed to anywhere else or that i can have only in that medium Mm. cool that is all of the questions we've got time for oh if you'd like to send us a question for a future episode, you can do so by emailing us questions at creightoncrowbar.com. You can tweet us questions at Crate and Crowbar, and you can hang out and chat in our Discord channel, which is, well, the link is in the top bar of the website. We'll get you an invite. Lovely place to talk to people. Um, the Crate and Crowbar is very kindly supported by our Patreon backers, who not only allow us to kind of, uh, you know, commit time to this podcast every week, but we just launched our, um, monthly miniatures spin-off podcast which is appropriately called monthly miniatures and we've got some more spin-off things on the way you can find out more about our patreon at patreon.com forward slash great and crowbar if you would like to follow us as individuals i'm at c thurston that's c-t-h-u-r-s-t-e-n pip is i really want to sneeze at twitter.com and alex <laughs> is <laughs> rotational which Why are you rotational? I don't know. I can't oh, okay. remember. It was a long time ago. I think it was a oh, it's a real net, a real word that no one else had. Well, all right then. What is your Twitter handle, Pip? Oh, it's at Philip War. Great. I can spell it. No, if it's, you... no it's fine. <laughs> oh, it's fine. I really need to sneeze. <laughs> Thanks, Thanks for sneezing, everyone.